Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, our first episode, what we hope to be, you know, a series that we call Creative Space. Um, we... Uh, uh, we'll introduce ourselves in a second, but uh, I just wanted to talk about what this what this is to kind of set expectations. Um, this is not like a traditional interview. You're not going to see us answer questions like, you know, how did you get your start in gaming or, you know, any of that kind of a thing. Um, instead, we're going to delve a little deeper. We're going to talk about things like creative processes and, uh, you know, inspiration and, and whatnot. And what we're hopefully going to see is a conversation between two creatives who have been doing this for quite a while. And, and we hope you'll find that interesting and maybe even insightful. Uh, but uh, without any further ado, um, why don't we quickly introduce ourselves here? I didn't know I had to introduce myself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm Shauna Germain. If you're watching this, you probably know a little bit about what I do, uh, but I'm a game designer and a writer, uh, an editor and a teacher, and I'm super passionate about the craft of what we do as a creative. And so uh, I'm very excited to get to talk about that kind of stuff. I'm Monty Cook, uh, the of Monty Cook Games, <laughs> um, and uh, I have been doing this uh, for a while now. Um, I have been doing all kinds of different writing uh, and game design and uh, a lot of different applications of sort of uh, creation uh, in a lot of ways over the last 30 years. And so... Uh, I don't know. Maybe I've learned something. <laughs> Hopefully, maybe. Um, we'll find out. <laughs> we'll find out. Yeah, exactly. Right. It's, uh, you know, the, the, the proof is in the, the pudding. <laughs> so I thought that maybe today, um, what we would do is start in a very, what will we'll tend to be a, a very broad way of looking at this, because as creators, we uh, start with uh, a, a basing building block, right? That is the it is the bricks and mortar and and everything of what we do, right? And and that's language. Um, and so, Shauna, you are uh, really adept, I think, at using language. Uh, to to really enhance and build upon your creations. And I kind of want to hear about what your just general take is on that and using language. What are the uses of language when you're sitting down to create something? And, you know, you're a, you're a poet, you're a fiction writer, you're a game designer, you've done all these different things. How does that apply? That's such a great question. Like, language is just so interesting in that way because... In, in many cases, it's the base. It's where we start is the sound of the thing and the origin of the words. And, and so often there's all these words that we don't even think about, like their context and their meaning. And so I'm really grateful as a poet that, you know, with a poem, you only get maybe 50 or 100 words at tops. And so you have to know what each of them means and kind of the history, the connotation that they bring with them. And so if you choose a church versus a chapel versus a steeple, like these all have different histories and they create a different resonance in the reader. And and particularly when you pair them next to each other. So suddenly you have a steeple paired next to a graveyard or a church next to a graveyard. And so as you start putting these words next to each other, then they have sort of multiple meanings. And so one of my favorite things is to start looking at the etymology of the words and seeing as a culture, what do those words carry emotionally and, and what can I do to enhance that or decrease that depending on the kind of the mood that I'm going for? And so, um, so you start with, with like a mood then and, and develop a language around that or, or what's, what's mm. the first step? Um, I think I start with a sound. And so if oh. I'm starting with fiction, um, that my character, I need to understand my character's voice, like what they sound like in their head. Um, and not just what they sound like in their head, but what they sound like in their head after they've had a couple of drinks, because that's <laughs> when we sort of let, we, le we let those guards down, right? And we start talking, or when you're talking to a really close friend. And so I think, you know, if, if I, this person was talking to the person they're most comfortable, they put all their barriers down, this is what they sound like in their head. Once I get that voice and that language, I can start to make, um, 
I can start to make a work. And I feel that way about setting too. Like setting has a voice. And if the setting was talking to its friend, its favorite setting friend, like how, how would these two different settings talk to each other and what would that sound be? And so I think I start with a, a sound, a voice more than a mood. Do you start, do you tend to start with like a mood or do you start with something other than language? Um, well now I start with language. <laughs> um, that's interesting. You know, when I first started, um, I was I was still just 20 years old, brand new writer, and I didn't think about language. Um, the first few uh, game products that I wrote, I, I didn't think about language. I didn't I wasn't experienced or mature enough to even think about that. I was only sort of caught up in the ideas, right? The how how this magic item works or how much damage does this creature do, right? Um, and so. Uh, I didn't, I didn't think about that kind of thing. And in fact, it wasn't until something came along and kind of hit me over the head with language that I first started to think about it. And that was when I started to work on the Planescape, uh, campaign setting because the Planescape campaign setting kind of turned a lot of heads back in the early nineties because of its use of language, right? Um, it had, it has its own vocabulary. It has its own cant, uh, its own, uh, 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 terminology and, and not just for like game things, but like for how people address each right. other, how, you know, people refer to success and failure and whatnot. And this just so opened my eyes. And I think that, uh, you know, that really shaped like how those products got designed and the kinds of things that you talked about in those products, um, whether you're writing an adventure or a setting source book or whatever, it was, uh, uh, you, because of the, the language that you were using to describe those things that you had described a million times before, you know, in a typical RPG way, uh, it, was it was something that you um you know it, it changed things right like like suddenly the way the language it, it it informed the kinds of adventures that you have i guess is what i'm trying to sure, say that makes sense right um it it probably you know uh, to to use a really blatant example like because the way that people spoke to each other was really interesting, it probably encouraged lots of interaction type encounters, right? right? You didn't just fight the, the things that you met, you talked to them. And, and so you would, as you were writing the things, you would provide the kinds of things that they would say in return. And suddenly it totally changed the way the game was played just by that language. That's really interesting because I was thinking about this once when we were um, we were playing a game and we were we, a creature had attacked us and we were attacking it back and the language that you used the vocabulary of the creature which wasn't a language that we knew but the way in which you intonated it made my character feel very bad for attacking it and so we're using <laughs> language in this whole way that like you know that even though it wasn't a language I understood we understand pain sounds we understand pain language in other languages in, in made up languages even and so I was I suddenly had this whole different thing of oh well maybe we should find another way to handle this encounter um based just on those that sort of language sensibility oh no you you, <laughs> you saw behind the curtain <laughs> you saw the strings moving you're not supposed and to I, look there. my character did not like it <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah you know um it it is interesting like so after I worked on Planescape and, and once I started working on, on third edition, I think that I tried, I think I changed my language. I mm. think like th throughout in, in all the different D Dungeons and Dragons products that I worked on, I think clarity became clarity and precision, right? Became sort of my, my beats that I went to. Um, and that's interesting because that also changes the way things work. Like, if mm -hmm. you're striving for just ultimate, clear, concise language, it's good for game design. Right. But sometimes it's not so great for mood. Right, right. right. Because you have, to in, it, you have to inject all the mood into it if it's just a clear and concise language. There isn't any 
there isn't it doesn't evoke a sensory detail which if you're if you're someone who likes to build your own mood into things like in a game that's useful but if you're someone who cares about who wants a setting that's created for you by someone who does that for a living injecting that mood through language is super important um and it isn't even just mood like if you think about for example like when you're building a setting, I think about this kind of stuff all the time. So if, if a setting is set, for example, in a watery, in a place where there's a lot of water, the characters, the people that live there will have a different language than people who live in a cityscape or a scape that doesn't have a lot of water because right. their voices need to carry across water. And so they're going to use different consonants and different vowels and, and different words wow, that's really in cool. order to communicate across water, which sounds very different than someone who's in a city and only needs to communicate like this or someone who's in a really enclosed space. And they need to be able to whisper. And, you know, the, the difference in the language between a whispering language and a language that needs to carry. I mean, we see it with animals all the time. And so the, the, the landscape can inform the language and then the language informs the landscape. So it becomes this really beautiful cycle, I think. And so do you incorporate that kind of thing? So obviously that that's the kind of thing that works its way into dialogue sure. and whatnot. But do you also incorporate that into prose and description? I do, because if if you are looking at trying to set a mood and trying to create it, like if you want to, let's, let's talk about gaming for one second. You want to create a character who's from that landscape. The mountains are, na mountains are named differently than oceans. Um, because, again, if you have a language that's mostly about communicating over water, then the language... Um, that you use for that water is going to also sound the same because you need to be able to communicate about the water over the water. And if you don't live in a place where there's mountains, you're not going to, you're going to describe mountains using water language because they're far away and, and that's the language that you have. And so I do think that, um, yeah, that they all, they all tie together and I do use them. Um, and, and it's great because it shows the difference between somewhat, you know, if there's a mountain range off in the distance and the people who live on water have a name for it, that's a, that's a water sound. The people who live on the mountain, they come here and, and they both call the same place different names. And it right. shows their cultural origins. It shows like their vocabulary. It shows the way they communicate with each other and how they're different or the same. Potentially then what you're talking about is a really, really subtle sort of i'm going to use a, a word here that is is harsher than i mean it to but a, a very very subtle manipulation for sure <laughs> of of the yes. reader of the of the gamer of the user like if you're using a lot of these sort of open uh, uh water words right that cool thing about that is like in a gaming sense the language that you use as a game designer even, you know, I'm not talking about like read aloud text, but the, right. the language that you use is going to end yes. up coming out of the mouth of the game exactly. master, right? Because you're sort of influencing that. And like, like one of the things that I think about is a very subtle sort of thing is, um, uh, you know, when you're dealing with like horror as mm -hmm. opposed to something like science fiction or fantasy, um, I think that. Well, well, actually, I want to I want to uh, talk about all three of those in separate <laughs> ways, right? Because science fiction is a very precise genre, right? Right. That thing is exactly thirty meters over there, yes. and it's a very uh, scientific genre, right. right? And there is a there is a name for the machine that right. is over there in the corner, and it has a specific purpose. In fantasy, things are a little bit more unknown, and you want to keep sort of the the, you know, the more open-ended kind of mystical, magical aspect and, and whatnot. But I think in horror, and this is where I started with, you know, with the sort of the subtle manipulation, I think in horror, you want, you, you specifically want imprecision, right? Like, like you don't say that the creature has, you know, nine legs and you know 15 eyes you you maybe talk about how it has too many legs right right because it, and, yes and, because know, that invokes the sense of a disturbing number of eyes or, or right. you know or, or right. whatever right or more eyes than you can count or something which like is, that which is actually really concrete in its own way right you're, what do you mean? so you were like we were talking about how, so science like you were saying science sci-fi language is very hard and concrete in in its own way right? right everything is built of squares as we know science right it's very like it's 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 um it's scientific and it's and it's straight and it's whereas magic language is flowing just like magic right it's got this natural bend to it but horror it's about being concrete and specific about 
the the mood, which is really different. So the the concreteness of creating the mood is too many legs, which seems like it isn't concrete, but it is. It's such a specific detail designed to evoke a sense of dread. I right. think. Right. Um, and it's like the difference. It's like very if, precise imprecision is what you're saying. Right. Right. <laughs> it's, it's perfect. It's per. It's perfectly precise. Like mm-hmm. you know, you can be precise, but be incorrectly precise. Right. Like you were saying, to you know, six legs doesn't mean anything. Particularly if it's in another culture where, you know, maybe six legs is the norm. And so, who knows, you know, you have six-legged creatures all the time or what. But it also portrays the uh, the state of mind of the observer, right? Sure. Because if some horrible beast with lots and lots of legs and eyes is coming at you're you, not you're count not them. Stop, you don't stop and <laughs> right. count them. Mm, right. right. You That's just exactly are like, right. ah, all right, too many legs, that, run, that kicks, run, run. That kicks you right out of the story, right? Because you're like, as someone who is in that space, I wouldn't count legs. I would just be like, that thing is, right. Right, is scary and has too many of, of all the things. Right. And I think you ca- captured something really important is them is creating is showing. This is particularly true in fiction, showing the mindset of the character by what they see. And so like some characters see things, some characters are more likely to hear things, some characters, sure. right? So, so using those sensory details to, to create a language that's very specific to the character is just such a wonderful way to make, to differentiate your characters and show how they see, you know, how they experience the world. Um, because some people uh, are very visual and some people are very like that olfactory is their thing. And so everything they, everything they notice has a smell or a scent and, and using the language that's really unique to them for those scents can just do so much work. Right. So it's interesting that, you know, it, like in a gaming context, I, I think because of the, you know, it, it actually goes back to like the origins of gaming as like a, like a war game with, with, you know, miniatures on the table or counters or whatever, right? That shows like a very precise, I'm going to move this, you know, exactly over here and I can, I can move it right. here, but I can't move it here. And, and, uh, and so like you get situations when you're running a game where like, you know, and there's horrible ad humans <laughs> streaming out of their room, right? And someone will say, well, how many are there? Right? And my response is always, oh, shit ton, right? You don't know. You're not going to stop and count, right? Because right. <laughs> they're not going to stop and let you count, right? right? You're just going to say, there's a bunch. Do you want to stay or do you want to run, right? right. Um, and, and And I think that... I mean, that's that's almost irrespective of a genre, right? For sure. Like, stress is going to change language, whether yes. it be, a, you know, a science fiction, whether it be a fantasy. Right. Uh, whether you're talking about prose, whether you're talking about gaming. Right. Right. And so is love, and so is grief. True. And, like, True. all of the emotions, like, your character, the, the language that they use for things changes. I mean, we know that there are biological changes that happen, neurological changes that happen when you're in love, just like when you're stressed out, right? And so the way that you see the world, the way that you experience the world changes, and thus the language that you use to talk about that experience changes. And so you can, you can have a character whose language is, it changes based on their emotional space. And the great thing is you can bring that back, right? So you, you talk about someone in love and they use the language and then they're in love again and they use the language and then they see that person and they're not in love and they have a whole different language. And it's not just a sadness language. It's a completely different way of just communicating, right? Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. And so how, um, how do you, how do you put that on the page? How do you actually show that happening? Right. That's a really good question. Um, I think there's lots of ways, but one of my favorite ways to use is objects. Um, and, and that sounds weird because it doesn't seem like it's about language, but it absolutely is. Right. Because, you know, if you're, if your person has an object, if your character has an object or your, you know, whoever has an object that really matters to them, let's say it's a necklace because necklaces are kind of easy. Um, and so they have this language around the necklace that connotates how they feel and the person probably that it was attached to or the experience that it was attached to. And so the way that I describe a necklace is really different, um, you know, depending on how, what it matters. So like, think about someone describing a necklace that's cursed and keeps coming back in a horror movie, in a horror show a story and, and how they, how they describe the metal and how they describe the sense of it being so cold and, and getting, they don't want to touch it. But that same necklace from someone who was given 
it by a loved one talks about the beautiful filigree and the ruby, you know, the ruby center that looks like a heart. And so the language completely changes and you can, you can just do so much emotional work with how people talk about the objects that are in their lives. Do you think, so here's something that we don't do, right? As game designers, at least not, not so overtly, right? We don't say to the game master, who is of course probably reading the source book or the adventure or whatever that we're, we're writing. Um, you don't say, make sure that when you describe this, you use <laughs> right. these kinds of words, right? Right. We just kind of give them an object. <laughs> yeah. But, but, but we use, if we're doing our jobs right, right? We use yes. the language that in the way that you're talking about. And again, we're just kind of hoping that like, like a river, it just keeps flowing, you know, all the way to the table, right? Right, which is really interesting talking about, let's, like, we should talk about Invisible Sun for a second. Because okay. I think it's really interesting that you talked about coming from a place where you didn't care about language at all in in that, you know, your very early days. Sure. Um, and then you moved into a place where you understood the power of language and started using it. And now I feel like Invisible Sun is sort of the completion of that arc in many ways. It's so poetic. And it's so, like, language is so important to the magic and the world and the setting. Like, talk of like, I, I'm super interested in, in why, where, where, how you came to be in that place. Right. Um, so in many ways, one of the goals of Invisible Sun, and there are a number of goals, um, but one of them was absolutely to actually capture the idea that magic is mysterious. Magic mm -hmm. is this thing, you know, that it, that you can't pin down, that you can't fully control. You can tap into it, you can try to coax it, right? But you, you're you never really in control of it, right? It is, you know, in a game context, so often, right, it doesn't matter whether I'm casting a spell that shoots a blast of power out of my hand or whether I've got a blaster right. and I'm pulling a trigger, right? right? Same effects. The, the game mechanics are exactly the same. The way it interfaces with the table, the pre but, but what, what I'm really getting at is, is that the predictability of mm -hmm. it, uh, becomes, uh, exactly the same. And so that's the kind of thing I wanted to move away from in Invisible Sun. And, I'll, and some of that's done through mechanics, which, you know, maybe we'll talk about it at a different time, but, it's also through the language. It's it's the way in which things are described or not described, mm -hmm. um, and uh, even right down to like the names of the spells right. and the names of the incantations, which are which are strange and evocative. And and I I feel like, you know, if you are um, if you're casting an incantation and uh, you know it's called uh, I love you more. I was when just you're thinking leaving. about that one. <laughs> love that one so much. Um, then that all of a sudden, just even sitting at a game table and saying, "I cast this," right? Uh, uh, it 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 changes the way things feel at the table, right? right. If if you know if if I cast teleport disruption, <laughs> right, that has a completely different connotation, right? And and so it. It, 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 I, I, I strove to to use language in that way. Um, it, it is it is it is exactly sort of the culmination of the things that we are talking about here, where hopefully the language that is in the books finds its way directly to the table, but not even just through the game master, right? Be but because it's worked into this, you know, it's going to be the players who are holding the cards right. that They're have these the spells and incantations and things on them. Um, and, and so it won't just be the game master who is instilling the surreal, weird, mystical, magical nature of the game, but the players will be contributing to that as well. And, and I think that's, that's kind of one of the ways in which uh, that game hopefully mm -hmm. achieves that goal. Um, you know, another thing that it does, and this is, this is a weird one. Um, and, but, you know, I said that it, it, I, the, it, the, 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 the things that get described and then the things 
it just as important as are the things that don't. Um, and the idea here is there is a sense of mystery. There is a sense of I don't understand everything about this world that is conveyed in the books mm -hmm. and in the text that you find in Invisible Sun. And, you know, this is a little bit true in Numenera, too. And that's very deliberate because... I want people to convey, I want game masters to convey that sense when they are portraying the setting. You're never going to understand. Like, in in a way, it's almost like the game master saying, even I don't fully understand everything about this because you can't understand, right? It's too big. It's too weird. It's too whatever. Um, you know, in, in a way... I'm, I'm actually saying as a game designer, as the creator of the world, I don't understand it all. It does. I mean, and, and that is, that is a very different take than a lot of people have. And in fact, I'm, I'm sure there are people actually even hearing me say that who think that I've done something wrong, right? right? Because, well, you're the, you're the creator. You have to know absolutely everything, right? You need to know who lives in that house and who lives in the house next to them and what lies down the street. Somebody's got to know that, right? Uh, or that, you know, you've got to be able to be the game master. So you've got to be able to answer all those questions. And, and there is truth to that, but, but, but it all comes down to the mood and the conveying of there are mysteries here. Right. And yeah, the game master, if he needs to come up with who lives in that house, you know, they can. Um, and, and the, and the, the game empowers them to do that and it informs them with ideas on how to do that. But it doesn't actually ever make it clear that there are hard and fast answers to those questions provided somewhere in a book somewhere, right? Um, cause that's a very different, like there are settings out there. There are game settings, right? right where it's just like, okay, you've got a question about this. It's that answer is in a book somewhere, right? right? Let me go to my bookshelf. And, uh, uh, you know, neither Numenera nor uh, Invisible Sun are designed to be that way. Well, let's, let's talk a little bit about some specific things that you've done. Um, like uh, with, with, say, predation. Right. Like I remember the conversations that we had where you talked about the naming of things mm. and, and in that setting, it's a very unique setting. And and so you had but you had a very sort of deliberate idea of why things were called the way they were. Talk, talk a little bit about that. Well, it was interesting because I was taking the language of dinosaurs, right, which is a, is a Latinate language that we, to, you know, the names of which that we don't really use anymore, except for taxonomy and, and things like that. And right. um, but most of the time, the reason that we call dinosaurs what we do is because of the meaning of those original names. And so I had that kind of language to work with as a base. Um, and then, um, I, uh, I was thinking about the far future. And so what I didn't want to use was terms from now to describe far future things because, um, th the, the language of technology changes so fast, right? Faster than anything else, right? Suddenly we have Google and blah, 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 and blah, 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 right? And it's just, it just, and it becomes, you know, cell phones and it becomes part of our language so quickly that to use language from the now to describe those many years in the future um, wasn't an option. And so what I started doing was I started looking at what is what are the science terminologies of future expectations? So I started looking at the language that scientists are using now to talk about the future, because even though it's based in this, it's already advancing, right? It's language that we don't use regularly. And so then I took it a step farther and I, and I broke it apart and I said, okay, well, this is the language we're using now. This is the language they're using to talk about the future. And then how is that language going to evolve one step further? And I kind of, I kind of extrapolated what I thought sure. it would be like. And so then you get this melding of the, the past and the future that doesn't exist yet it, traveling back together and kind of smushing together. And so I, I wanted dinosaurs, for example, that were by an engineer to have both the history of dinosaurs because that doesn't go away. That doesn't change, right? Unless a dinosaur is found to be a different species or whatever, in which case it gets a new name and, and the future understanding of what we thought dinosaurs would, would be like. And so I was mushing the language together. Um, and also things like, you know, having access to regular time travel or having access to other worlds 
um, and, and advanced cultures and different cultures changes the language as well. So I was bringing in, uh, I, I tried to make it not super uh, sort of Americanized because I, I think, I hope that in the future, uh, we will have a lot more cultural intersection right. and, and the language, you know, it won't be, um, so much focused, focused on just English. The languages will meld more. And so I did a lot of that, um, for names and place names and those kinds of things. Um, yeah. Do you think that that means, if uh, an English speaker reads predation and sees some of the names, are are some of the names going to seem odd or, or or like trip on their tongue a little bit? And 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 is that intentional? Um. Yeah. I mean that, that, that you know you can create mystery through unknown language. Yes. And you know and the way that you put words together, uh, we've talked about this before, where you don't say um, the red little house, you say the little red house. Right. right. And so there's a there's a way in which we uh, as our culture speak and put words together and it's size, color, something else. Like it's a it's a specific way when we talk about big bad wolf, for example. Right. We've got these color, you know, size first and then a sort of descriptor of of uh emotional state. Right. Um, and so what, you know, one of the ways that you can do that is by understanding how we expect language to work, even if we don't know that we expect it to work that way. Like we don't think about the fact that we put words in that order. We just do it because right. it sounds right. Right. And so the first time you start breaking that, so like if you describe a dinosaur as um, a little gray, uh, brunt, brunt, uh, like let's do it, uh, like a little gray T-Rex, then suddenly that's normal, right? But if you describe it as a gray little T-Rex, that sounds super weird and as though it has been made to be gray and little as opposed to sort of a natural state because it breaks it. Right. And so we think about it. So I, I did try to do that. I did try to make it so not uncomfortable, but so that it draws attention to itself because it's purposeful. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so do you ever find... You know, we talked a little bit at the beginning about, you know, starting with the language and whatnot. Have you ever found as you're getting into something, and this might be fiction, it might be game design, um, where you, you, you start delving in and you realize that the language that you're kind of naturally uh, putting into it is starting to drift, right? Like, like the process of creation is changing the language that you're using and you're making you realize that the language that you had set out, you know, you know what I mean? I do. Yeah. That's a, that's a really interesting question because I think it's, it's maybe not the process of writing so much. Well, I, this is tied together. It's the process of coming to understand the thematic elements in, in a story or in a thing I'm telling because the thematic elements, the language needs to change for that. Um, and so like, if you start writing a story and you think it's about this woman and it, and you're writing along and then it turns out that that woman is actually a siren for example, you're going to go back and you're going to tweak everything that that person sees and make it based with water, make it based with losing your legs, make it based with losing your voice. And so suddenly the language, you know, somebody who's opening somebody who's who's opening a refrigerator and leaning in, right, is the language of a woman. Somebody who's opening their refrigerator and being cut off halfway through that lean is the voice of a, like a mermaid or a siren, right? Because you're cutting off your legs visually. And so sometimes when I come to understand wow. the theme of a story, I change the language to deepen that theme because people aren't going to notice. They don't notice. They don't, they don't consciously, unless they're thinking about it, notice the difference between leaning into the fridge um, and leaning into the fridge and, and cutting off, you know, part of your tor torso. Like though that's not overt, but it adds this depth. And so, yeah, I think that as I come to understand theme, my language changes a lot. Do you find that it's theme related or something else? Like just um, so <clears throat> in Invisible Sun, for example, uh, I do a lot of things with um, whether a certain aspect of the game is written in first person, right. second person, or third person. Right. And so all of the NPCs and the creatures are written in second person. Right. Right. So, um, you know, it doesn't say, uh, you know, such and such a creature likes to devour the flesh of humans. It says you like to devour the flesh of humans. <laughs> right. right. And the idea there, of course, is to get the game master really sort of in the mindset because he's, he or she's got to really provide that experience right that you the, the that creature that npc has to be put Embodied. right there on the on the table right yeah 
And so, um, I like, I, I can give you an example. Like I was creating an NPC who was, uh, another Vizlay, another wielder of magic and, uh, just like the player characters. And I wanted this guy to be like a villain. I uh, wanted him to be, uh, a, um, you know, just, just a, a, a bad guy, right? He's a mercenary. He's a, he's a basically a Vizlay for hire, right? He'll, he'll do whatever you hire him to do. And I started writing that, but I was writing because I was writing it in that very specific voice and describing, um, this character. I felt as I was writing it in second person, I was really getting into the mindset of yes. this character, probably more so than I would have if I was sort of. You know, because in third person, Distance. there's a yeah, you're holding them yeah. at arm's length, and you're just saying, okay, this guy's right. a this guy's a shithead. Right? <laughs> um, but this guy, you know, because I'm writing it in second person, and I'm describing about how he's getting he 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 has to earn his money because his father has a degenerative mm. mental disorder, you know, basically like Alzheimer's, and and is getting worse and worse, and so he's got to you know. He's got to cover all of his father's expenses and and spend all of his extra time helping his father and everything. And I'm putting that in second person, and and suddenly this guy, I mean, he's still he's still an antagonist, probably for the player characters. But boy, did it yeah. the, the use of that language. Boy, did that change that character. And I think it will change the way that that when that character shows up at the game table. Right. I think I think the game masters will There's portray a lot of depth him there. very differently than if I yeah. had done that in third person. I found myself I remember when I was editing that, I was reading through that and I was thinking, oh what a bad guy. And then I was like, oh, oh right. And so you could see him like, you know, I think it's a really it, what it reads like, it's interesting to hear you talk about how it cha- the language changed as you wrote it, because it reads like someone who's a little bit in denial of his his experiences. And then the more he t- sort of talks, the more he's like, but this is what's really happening. And that's such a that's such a human response that not only do we, resp- we respond to the language you chose, but we respond to this understanding of someone who's holding his own problems at harm's length. Right. And then by the end of him talking, you're like... Now he's really on his third drink to his best friend. He's really able to break down those walls. And so we, as humans, I, I think really sympathize and empathize with that as well. That is exactly the way I ended up writing that was, yeah, you know, you, 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 you have to read through the whole thing, right? In yeah. the same way that you have to kind of delve through somebody's layers and masks right, and armor, life, yeah. right? In real life to actually get to the heart of him. Because if you do just read the first paragraph, you do just think Jerk. he's <laughs> just an asshole who does anything for money, right? Right. So, yeah. That gives players a lot of, of opportunity to explore a character, too. Right? Because at first he's just going to be an asshole who does anything for money. And then if they continue to have a relationship, which is common in Visible Sun, people come back. NPCs, you know, right. have long-term sort of arcs just like PCs do. Like, they can sort of start to discover something deeper within this guy. And I think that's such a great moment for players. So... In what other ways do you see using language in what you work on as, uh, as did, like we've talked about how like mood and setting and character change language, but what about like the, the end user, right? The reader, the gamer, whatever. How does that right. change your language? Like, I mean, the really obvious example there is no thank you evil. Right. right? <laughs> right. I became the pun queen for no thank you evil for a little while there. Um, and in fact, you know, sort of after working on no thank you evil, because it's geared towards such young kids and I wanted the language to be very vibrant and poppy and, and a lot, there's a lot of monosyllabic words. It's weird that monosyllabic has so many <laughs> That's right. There's a lot of very short, uh, concise sort of pithy, like statements and stuff. I was actually walking around the house and I couldn't stop thinking in rhyme and sort of this like invisible, or this no thank you evil language which is um, kind of interesting how it also takes over your brain and then right. I had to shift gears because I think I worked on um, predation or maybe the poisoning or I can't remember after that and so it was a totally different language space right um, and I think it's also really interesting because um, when you th- when I one of the th- one of the problems I st- really struggled with as a beginning writer is my and I blame this on my parents who raised me with like, the language, like the songs of like Dylan and Baez and these poets, sing, singer songwriters, but you couldn't really understand what they were saying. Um, and cause they, they, they were sort of like beautiful and, and yet 
like I didn't know what a lot of them meant. And so I understood language and I understood beautiful like language that that just was so rich and deep. But the readers got lost in it because I didn't know how I didn't know how to care about the reader. I didn't know how to make language that did more than just stand there and be beautiful. And so one of the things that I really had to learn early is to sort of to really like empathize with the reader right? right and and it's hard because as a beginning writer people talk a lot about like think about your reader or don't think about your reader right depending on how much panic that sort of gives you <laughs> but i think there's a middle ground where you have to think about like and so what i think about is how does this ran, land on the reader's body what is the physical reaction a reader will have to what i'm saying and sometimes that physical reaction just needs to be i understand this right mm-hmm. so no thank you evil is fun but it's also does, you know, does a child who maybe is on the autistic scale or maybe has trouble reading, do they understand this? Can they follow the language? Um, and that's true even of poetry. Like, I know that there's a, that there's a sort of poetry is kind of weird because a lot of people are like, I don't understand poetry. And that's just sort of poetry's definition. Um, <laughs> but, you know, and, and with game, all game design, first and foremost, do they, does it make sense? Do they understand it? And then with fiction, I want them to feel it. Do they feel it is, is the question I ask myself. Um, and, and understanding is also important for that. But I found I had to pull back from the language in order to think about the reader and not the language first, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, uh, I think that this is actually a, a big challenge for writers of almost any type, right? Like, uh, certainly for game design, I think that people have, people struggle early on when they first start game design is, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll describe a thing, right? They'll describe or, you know, a rule, right? They'll describe something that has mechanical aspects at the game table. Um, they'll do it in a way that they understand, right? right? And it never, they never take the next step and think about, well, what if I'm on the other side of this and, and I'm reading this, am I going to understand it? And, right. and moreover, like if this actually gets put in front of a bunch, you know, five or six players, are they going to understand it? What questions are they going to have? Yeah, the question ones when I always forget and it's so important. Yeah. It's like the next yeah. step. You've got to kind of anticipate Right. The questions that they, you know, because so the game hard. master is sitting there, you know, and the players are asking, you know, him or her questions and they're like, I don't know. <laughs> right. Which right? is different than the mystery. Doesn't say what's behind the door, right, right. or whatever. Confusion right? and mystery are not the same thing, right? Exactly. Talk about mystery earlier. Exactly. This oh, is, what a, this what is what confusion. A, <laughs> and what a fine line that is, right? right. Um, like, yeah, and I think that a lot of that has to do with the broad setting and the specific scene and and you know this probably applies to to fiction as well right like if i'm the game master and i'm running some adventure that someone has designed and written for me like in the in the micro like in the small scale if you tell me that there's uh you know a, a door but you don't tell me what's behind the door You've you've screwed up as a designer, right? right? That is right. that is just confusion. Someone's going to open it, exactly, <laughs> right. right? Exactly, <laughs> and so that's the difference, right? Because in a broad sense, you can you know, like if if the player characters are going into this weird, mysterious ruin, um, you know, maybe they don't need every detail of everything that has ever happened in that ruin, right? That's just it's too much information. It's 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 you know, ruins the mystery or whatever, but. But they need to know what's happening right then in the present. They right. need to know what what does my character see? What does my character hear? If I go and push this thing, right, right, what's and, behind and it? And if you don't give those answers straight out, you need to give the GM answers on how to make it up. Is sure. my theory right? So right, right. So like you don't ha- like in fiction, that's the sort of proverbial gun on the mantle place, right? If you put a gun in the scene one. You know that it has to appear somewhere. It has to matter. Right. You put a, if you put a, you know, an X in a cave, it better matter because your players are going to expect it to matter. And right. so even if you don't ans- answer the question of what's behind the door, you can give the GM, you can say to the GM, okay, here's, here are some ways to answer that question. Or here is the theme you're going for. And you can answer the question however you want based on these like guidelines. Right. Um, 
Right, right. Like a like a common gaming thing to trip you up that that would trip someone up there. Like, like let's say you're you're writing a, a fantasy adventure and you go into this dungeon room, right? And there's a fountain, and uh, there's water in the fountain, and you you know you might say, oh, and you know if anyone happens to you know place a weapon in the fountain, it becomes magical or whatever, right? Well, that's all fine and good. But what happens if somebody drinks it? Sticks their hand in there. What happens, right, if I take a bucket and I fill the bucket and then I leave, right? These are the kinds of things that happen in a role-playing game. These are the kinds of questions that you have to answer. You have a lot more control in fiction because, right, you can, you can, nobody can choose to take the bucket with them. You have the character take the bucket or you don't, right? Right. So it's interesting. And I think when I first started out, that was one of the things that I really learned a lot about writing adventures is you would be like, okay, well, here are the six things your characters are going to try to do with this adventure that you don't have any answers for. And so now I always ask, okay, what are, what are, what are the six players? I have like these six players in my brain. What are they going to do in this adventure that I haven't answered? Right. Um, and do I need to answer them? Cause sometimes it's like, well, you just stick in your hand in the water and does it make an effect, but they still need to know that they still need to know that there's right. no effect. Right. Yes. I think that that's absolutely true. You know, but, I think the best or one of the best pieces of fiction writing advice that I ever got uh, that's right along these lines is, is that your reader should know exactly what they need to know right at that moment right. and nothing right. more. When they need to know Right. It, yeah. And so that's almost like the opposite end of the spectrum, right? Where we're talking about anticipating questions, right? right? But in fiction... And maybe in game design, but particularly in fiction, the last thing that you want to do is answer questions that, that nobody's asking. Right, that nobody's asking, because then you're just boring, it's, right? <laughs> right, right. I mean, you know, we've, we've all seen that, right? It's too much exposition. Right. You know, right? We have names like that Info That balance and... is one of the hard, I think, as a fiction writer, that balance between what the reader no- needs to know and when they need to know it is so hard because it's, again, mystery or confusion, right? You're, you're trying right. to create mystery without creating confusion and definitely without creating boredom. And so finding that happy middle in there... It's so hard and you have to assume your readers are really smart and that they're going to get it. But it, your readers can't be way smarter than your character. They're going to start thinking your character's stupid. Right. And so there's a, it's, a, right. it's just such a balance. Oh, it's really, really hard, I think. Yeah, I think that you, uh, my theory is that is that you want, I, the perfect situation is when the reader is just a little <laughs> bit smarter than the character, right? right. Because like if the, if, if the reader figures out the thing, just one page before the character figures right. it out. You don't think that the character is stupid, but you think you're, you're really smart, smart right? yeah. and you, so you feel good about yourself. That's the goal, right? <laughs> right. right. Yeah. So uh, I sort of feel like we could have. We I could know we keep, could talk about this forever. We could keep this conversation going on and on and on, and we're going to do more uh, uh, creative spaces. But do um, we do have a, a couple of questions, um, and so uh, let me just throw some of these out here uh questions from the chat um so uh there's a question what's that i was reading over your shoulder oh sorry yeah (laughs) um so a a lot of them are invisible sun related not not surprisingly right uh so beauty mark studio says asks uh in choosing intentionally arcane slash obscure language to evoke mood and invisible sun did i ever reach a point in the editing process where we realized that we'd gone too far and had lost clarity Mm, and become aware of the line um yeah, uh, probably a few times mm-hmm. um, as we, 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 we maybe had to dial things back or provide a little bit more um, explanation. But, but for the most part, you know, Invisible Sun's development period was very long. Um, and so there was a lot of time to really kind of get into that mind space and... Um, you know, this is a weird sideways answer to that question, but I always used to, when I, when I, when I worked on projects, I always used to like to have two projects going on at oh, right. once, right? Work on two different game lines, two different, you know, whatever. Um, but I have found that with Invisible Sun, I can't do that, or, or rather it, it's very difficult to do that. And I think that that is because I had to develop sort of this Invisible Sun 
mind space that uh, was was sort of the you know way of using language and way of using description and whatnot that was just right. Um, and you know, uh, I guess the game's not out yet. We'll we'll find out <laughs> if, if I succeeded or failed. Um, but uh, uh, you know. There are going to be places where people who uh, are reading through Invisible Sun, they're going to have to run to a really good dictionary a few times. I had to, and I was editing it. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, so true. I very intentionally used a lot of older words and obscure words, again, but in order to describe magical things, right? Mm -hmm. In order to describe things that were sort of... You know, you know, one of the one of the I mean, the actual definition of the word occult is hidden. Right. right? And so uh, if something is 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 has to do with the occult, it's hidden. Um, and and so some of it is hidden in more obscure language and whatnot. Now, if you don't ever want to run to a, a dictionary, you don't have to, right? right? You're just like, okay, this spell has a really <laughs> weird to do with fire. <laughs> has a really weird name, right? I, I don't know what that word means, um, uh, but it has a meaning, right? There, somewhere, right? There aren't any made up words there aren't. in in that in that context, right? In like spell names and stuff like that. Those are all real words. I think it's the, what you're talking about brought up two really interesting elements too. One is that. Um, you know, the, the language between things like spell names and the actual rules are slightly different because the actual rules, again, di are more about, are slight, are more about understanding than beauty. Right. And spell names are more about beauty than understanding. And so even though they work really beautifully with together and intermingle, I think you intentionally created a break between the two different types of language so that the, you know, that, so that it is easier to understand how to actually play the game versus, like you were saying, you right. don't need to know what the name of that spell means. Right, um, which is exactly what we were talking about before, right? right. About sort of the, the clarity of the micro versus the the mystery of the macro. Right. right. I was also thinking about how you were saying now that you like to work on one project because, because you get into that mindset, which of course brought me all the way back to the difference between people living on water and people living in a mountain region. Like you are living in the invisible sun landscape. And so you have created a language that benefits you living in that landscape. And so when you live in a different project landscape, it has a different sound and a different meaning and a different connotation. And so when you're working on two projects, it's like you are working in two languages at once, right? Like a, a right. Uh, and so, um, particularly if the languages are different, that is, that is hard on your brain to be constantly switching like that. Right. And you know, this is only tangentially related, but what you said reminds me of this, right? Is that there's, there's different kinds of uh, intentional obfuscation in order to in order to heighten the mystery. Uh, and what I mean by that is, so in, in in Invisible Sun there are spells and incantations. There are a lot of other things too, but let's just talk about spells and incantations. Spells often have words with uh, names with words that are obscure or old, right? And you're not really sure. Oh, that's a that, that word's a mouthful right. kind of names. Incantations never right. use language like that in their names. Instead, they have very poetic names using very un easily digestible words right. that convey an emotion, right? It's like it, it, one of the phrases I heard uh, when I was learning how to write is called burnt tongue, where you take really common language and you break it. So, like, rather than say, like, you know... X, Y, Z, you break it and you create that word by using it in a day, a way that's very colloquial or very unique to you. And, and I feel like Invisible Sun does that on that side. It's very burnt tongue. Cool. Yeah. Uh, I was awesome. going to say something else and I forgot what it was. Oh, well. There's so much like, oh, oh, I was going to talk, I was going to say, we didn't even get to talk about like codes and ciphers and shibboleths and this, the whole other language under language that I totally wanted to talk about too. And I, Do it. I know, no, I know that we're running out of time. It's a huge topic. There's so much to talk about, but codes and ciphers and shibboleths, and they just all make me so happy, like secret languages, and I just love all that kind of stuff. All right, well... That's... I'm pretty sure every book I've ever written has at least one of those in it. Yeah. Can you give us an example? Uh, well, there's the, the language of the butterflies and the predations is very much... Um, I, I wouldn't say it's a shibboleth, but it's very much a code language, and so they have all these things that they are that they are communicating to each other 
um, through a very particular language that's based on the Ray Bradbury short story, which is one of the few surviving stories um, that survived into the future and was brought back to the past. And they had a single copy of it and they sort of made it their Bible. And so they have all these code words based on the specific language and cadence and sentences that are in that short story, uh, The Sound of Thunder. So like, I, you know, it's all interwoven and, and nobody's going to notice it but me, but I love it anyway. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, so uh, Horatio 78A uh, uh, says, from seeing Invisible Sun games on Twitch, reading the setting online, it seems like the best Invisible Sun Game Master is a professional improvisational poet. Oh, I love that. <laughs> uh, how do you even develop the skills necessary to run it? Wow. Um, you know, uh, hopefully it's all right there in the book, uh, or in the box, rather, the, the in the black cube. Um, there's a lot of time and attention devoted... Uh, in the text to exactly how to how to portray the setting, how to uh, run the game. Um, and there are there are some hidden tricks that are actually woven into the game uh, in as just one example uh, in in the course of playing the game uh, at significant moments or if you're in action mode every round you play a sooth card from the sooth deck. And they have these evocative names and they have these really cool surreal images and symbols and whatnot. Um, and they all have meaning and it has an immediate, you know, game meaning of, oh, now this particular type of magic is enhanced and this right. is diminished and whatnot. But there's an extra secret little GM trick woven into all of those because each card has meaning like a, like a tarot card, um, in, you know, in that way that, you know, in different contexts, it means different things and whatnot. And all of that is meant to be sort of the, the GM's cheat sheet, right? That, that you don't know exactly what, uh, is going to happen next because, you know, you're kind of going along as an improv kind of exercise, but these are prompts, right? These are the things that you can draw upon, um, whether it be the meaning or if you don't even want to bother with the actual meanings that are written up in the text, you can just look at the art, right? right. And just look at the name and, yeah. and draw inspiration from that. And the cool thing about that is not only does that not seem like cheating, <laughs> right? Your players are going to start to feel like, oh, these sooth cards actually really matter, right? Yeah. They actually it's really spooky. <laughs> do tell the future in a way. Um, they are, you know, showing us how the world interacts and whatnot because they are shaping what the Game Master is telling us happens. Um, and so rather than being, um, you know, like I said, like a, like a, like a cheat, it actually seems like that's the way it's supposed to be. And, yeah. and I, and, and so, uh, there's, there's other things like that that are worked into the system to make, as long as you can sort of jump in the boat and say, okay, this running this game is different from other games that I've run. Uh, and you understand that all the tools are hopefully there so that you can, you can do it. Yeah, I think too, like, first of all, I love the phrase professional improvisational poet. I think it's glorious. <laughs> um, I also think that, that um, in many ways, as a GM in this space, sometimes your job is the opposite, where you, we, you know, we talked about concrete versus mystery. And so like your job is to, is, is to describe the street in a way that the players uh, can see it and understand it and, and feel it. And so like, that's in some ways, that's less of the poetry stuff than it is just concrete descriptions that are informed by poetry. And then the players, I, I think that often the players start adding in the poetry, right? Cause we've got the spells and the incantations and like one of my characters has a spell where if I, or I think it's a secret where if I rhyme, if I rhyme, when I, when I cast my spells, I get some benefits. And so like that puts the onus on the players if they want to, to sort of start be becoming improvis improv improvisational poets. That's hard to say. <laughs> it's true. Um, and so it's, it's not all on the GM. It's some of that is on the players as well. Yes. You know, as a person who is GM most of the time, you'll probably notice that in particularly in my designs of like the last 10 years, um, I try to put as much work on the players <laughs> as possible, make my life easier. Right. 
Um, so that's why, you know, in my games, GMs don't roll, roll dice. They're not looking up <laughs> a lot of charts or anything or any charts. Um, it's all, all the work. <laughs> it's, all, it's all story. And then, of course, now I've worked in a, you know, the sooth deck and whatnot so that even even the story has got a story prompt. So the DM, the GM doesn't have to do anything. It's easy. <laughs> easy. <laughs> Um, I see we have more questions, but we are out of time. Do we run yeah. over? Do we answer um, them later? Is, so we, uh, let's you? take one really maybe quick one. Um, this is an interesting one. It's another Invisible Sun one. Um, in a game like Invisible Sun, where despair is just as important as joy, uh, how do you deal with downer moments for your players when most folks seem <laughs> to want the arc of their game to swing ever upward? Uh, how do you make sure that sad moments or hard moments, brutal moments, are just as rewarding as moments of triumph and accomplishment? That's a good question. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, uh, you... Well, you know, that that's why the despair mechanic is in there, right? It, it, it definitely softens the blow. When you know that you need both joy and despair to advance your character, it softens the blow <laughs> that, you know, when something terrible happens, oh, but I get despair, so that's, you know, oh, it's a good thing, right? Um, so I can now use that to make crux and make it so nothing bad happens to my character ever again. <laughs> You know, and a lot of that has to do with, again, talking about uh, narrative spaces, about how, you know, when we watch a show uh, or we read a book, watch a movie, we see our characters that we love and follow, right? If you watch The X-Files, mm. for example, right, you love Fox Mulder. Mulder's awesome. But he gets the crap beaten out of him all the time, right? That guy is, especially like in the early seasons, that guy was in the hospital almost every single episode. And and I think that, you know, we we, we kind of, we want to see our heroes put in jeopardy. And right. in a role-playing game, that is, our heroes are our player right. characters, right? And so you can't really have moments of total triumph if you're always up here, sometimes you've got to be down here so that you can rise up to here and have a triumph, right? It's just like, you know, when you talk about horror, right? You can't have things be super intense and scary all the time or it stops being super intense and scary, right? You've got to have levels. You've got to have places where things are down here so that you can heighten it. And I think that joy and despair work exactly the same way. And that's true of fiction. That's true For of sure. gaming. Um, all Invisible Sun does is, is, is sort of encourage that, that thing that we are very familiar with in fiction of all different kinds to also happen at the game table. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. I won't, I won't tell the story of the, the giant time my character got despair and it broke both of our hearts. Uh... <laughs> and it was glorious. It was glorious. <laughs> Someday I'll tell that story. All right. All right. I think we're out of time. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, we are. Um, uh, thank you for your questions. Uh, thank you for joining us. I hope that this was interesting um, and, uh, and maybe informative. Uh, we hope to do another one of these uh, in a few weeks where we'll be talking about different topics uh, and, and um, you know, maybe we'll kind of take this as a starting point and we'll move on to something organic uh, uh, that comes next. Um, you know, we have a lot of other stuff going on on our Twitch channel. We're trying to really kind of do a lot on Twitch nowadays. So tomorrow night at uh, this same time, right? I think it's at six. I don't know. Sean? We are. <laughs> Sean is giving us all the questions. Actually, stuff. you're right. It's at it's at seven Pacific tomorrow. Um, we have another installment of our Invisible Sun Twitch game streaming game. Um, uh, the Raven wants what you have. It's so uh, much fun. It's another really good episode. Um, I think you'll you'll, <laughs> you'll see some some crazy antics going on. Um, and then, uh, you know, go to montecookgames.com 
We've got a page there that's going to show, that's going to talk about, you know, our upcoming Twitch events, keep you informed. We've got brunch coming up too. I think Darcy's doing like a Game Master brunch pretty soon. Yeah, so. it might be okay, Sunday. Um, we know, should I wish we, we <laughs> I wish we were more informed. Um, 7 p.m., Sean says, tomorrow. 7 p.m. Oh, Pacific maybe. tomorrow. Um, and then on Sunday, I believe we're doing uh, Darcy, Darcy Ross. Uh, the amazing Darcy Ross is doing a gamer brunch that is, I think she's going to talk about, she's going to have a new, yeah, new GMs and getting into game mastering when, you know, it's something new to you, uh, which is something that I love. I love, you know, one of my favorite comments to hear that I, that we get a lot is with the Cypher system, Numenera, that, um, you know, this was the game that made me yeah. want to become a game master. And I love that, right? Because I think game mastering is the best. And to see more people kind of join the ranks, I think is fantastic. Uh, so yeah, yeah. that's, uh, that's Creative Spaces. Uh, thank you again so much for joining us. Uh, tune in to montecookgames.com and we'll, you'll find out when the next one's going to be, plus all the other cool, cool stuff. Channel. Yes, yeah. please follow us on Twitch. And let us know what you think. I mean, this is our first one. So if you liked it, if you think have suggestions, we're totally open to... Absolutely. Absolutely. Let's, let's sit here and talk about anything, really. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, guys. Bye.